All right, that said, I'll say go Gophers. Okay, go Gophers. Well, this morning we are uh, honored to have with us Tim Tomlinson. Tim has been, uh, you've heard his name. If, if you've been around the last uh, six months or so, you've heard Tim's name. Uh, he works with, serves with Strengthening the Church, and he's been meeting with PT, um, just helping us to understand why we exist as a church, even as individuals. And last weekend, he was one of our speakers at our men's retreat, and so we're excited to have him. He also has a, uh, we share a connection back to the days of good old Northwestern when I was there, Northwestern College, now University of Northwestern, but... Uh, Tim used to teach there, uh, and he was president of Bethlehem Seminary and helped get that started, and so currently serving with Strengthening the Church. So thanks for being here, Tim. I'll turn over this podium to you. All right. <clears throat> well, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, I feel like I already have a, a level of affection for you, even though I haven't met most of you uh, in the process of working with the pastoral team over these last many months. Uh, we've done a lot of prayer and a lot of uh, discussing of how can we help encourage you as a church and how can we help uh, enlarge your vision for what God has in store for this church in this community at this time. So I'm grateful to be able to be a part of your worship service this morning as well and pray that God will use it as we launch into his word, which is so amazing, so marvelous. Let's just pray as we jump into the word. Father, I do thank you for this great day. I thank you for your amazing grace. I thank you for your sovereignty. I thank you for your glory, which... For us as human beings on this side of eternity is difficult to grasp. So I pray that you would help us now to see more of you, to grasp more of your greatness and your bigness, Lord, as we contemplate our nations here at this point in history. So Lord, would you be with us now over these next minutes, and I pray for your help and that you would help me, Lord, to... Um, rightly divide your word. So, Lord, bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one of the questions that I want to ask you this morning as we get started in this is a question that I've heard expressed um, many times and increasingly so, and that is how many people in the Christian faith are feeling more and more like strangers in their own culture? In their own land. And I wonder if that describes you. Do you feel more and more like an exile in your own land? And it's certainly understandable if you do. I mean, all of us who have our eyes open and our news feeds on and our social media working are seeing news stories and discussions and events that are troubling to most of us, whether it's a, a war halfway across the globe in the Ukraine, or whether it's developments closer to home, what we're witnessing is what appears to be rampant evil on the move and in the works. And, and so when we think about those things, we, we wonder what can be done? What can happen that would change things for the better? How can we live a happy, satisfied life, joy-filled life in the midst of all this turmoil that we see? And sometimes the turmoil hits very close to home. Sometimes it's something that might happen in your church, something that might happen in your community, something that might happen in your personal life. And in fact, it will likely happen if it hasn't already. So I've been dwelling on that question myself thinking about exile status for Christians. And when you look at our history, that is the history of Christianity, you understand that exile status is the norm. Christians are almost always exiles wherever they live, in whatever culture they are in. You go back to the first century church, 
They were exiles. They were always under persecution from either the Jewish uh, leaders or from the Roman leaders. And that was true for hundreds of years. And if you look at the rest of history, there are only a few brief momentary periods in history where Christians were accepted widely and were viewed as regular folks. And if you're old enough, and like me, you've experienced that during your lifetime. What we've experienced here in America for hundreds of years is an anomaly for Christians, that our values were essentially the same as the broader culture's values. Well, that's no longer true today. We are witnessing continued rapid moral decline in our broader culture, and it's especially focused around sexual deviance. All kinds of sexual deviance is now more prominent, more accepted, more promoted than ever before. It is, in fact, celebrated, being celebrated and featured in literature and movies and curriculum and advertising and promoted by big business. <laughs> the revelation this week, perhaps that some of you are aware of, the Disney Corporation's plan to indoctrinate children with various sexual deviant um, promotions in their programming was shocking to some who, you know, kindly think of Uncle Walt from the days of the early origins of the Disney organization and now to recognize that their ambition is to change your children's values about sex. So the days of being able to implicitly trust Sources of so-called family-friendly programming and education and entertainment are over. And they actually have been for some time. And then you add to this all the personal hardships that each one of us faces. And you think about the collapse of culture, the culture that has been relatively kind to Christians up to this point, and you think about your personal situation, whether it's dealing with health issues or whether it's dealing with family tensions or whether it's other sorts of challenges in your workplace, it's no wonder people are feeling confused, on edge, angry, disillusioned, hopeless in some way or another. And so the question is not whether any of those things is true for you because if it isn't true, it will be true sometime. The question is, what's the answer to all of this? What's the answer? Should we be involved in trying to change our culture from the inside by going through the political process and, and trying to elect candidates who would reflect biblical values as opposed to the deviant values that we see now? Absolutely. Absolutely we should do that. And if there's anybody in this room who's running for political office, I pray that God will put you in office and that he will use you for his glory and that you will stand fast on biblical truth and not compromise the way so many others have compromised. But that is not the solution ultimately. It's, an, it's a form of common grace that God grants us. And so I pray that he will continue to pour out that common grace on us, but is not the ultimate answer. Only God can change a culture. Only the Lord has the power to change hearts which need to be changed from rejecting God to embracing God. So my answer to the question, what are we supposed to do with all this? When you consider these things and you lament the way you see things around you, our first response when we are troubled should be to turn to the Lord, to turn to Him, we must get our bearings, because when you're surrounded by darkness or surrounded by discouragement, it's easy to just kind of let that pile up and to bury you and to make you feel like, I don't know what to do. I can't do anything. But that what we need to do is to get our bearings. I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but there are times when I've taken a nap or something. Sunday afternoon, my wife and I, you know, have sort of fallen into this habit of getting a Sunday afternoon nap. I love Sunday afternoon naps. 
It's a wonderful gift from God to be able to rest from a hard week and be able to catch up on a little bit of extra sleep. But sometimes when I wake up from this nap, I am so groggy, I don't know what day it is, I don't know what time it is, I don't know, well, I do know who my wife is, I'm not, I've never been that groggy where I forgot who this lady was who's sitting next to me, but what I have to do is I have to take a couple of minutes and get my bearings, and think, okay, wait, oh, it's Sunday, yes, oh, okay, and what time is it? It's three o'clock, oh, okay, all right, now I know what's going on. But it, until you get your bearings, there's a moment of confusion where you think, what's going on here? Another experience in, in my life in regard to that was my wife and I were in the Black Hills doing some hiking uh, two years ago, and you know we enjoy hiking and camping. That's our favorite form of recreation, and we were taking the new trail, and we had you know our little map, and we're heading off into the hills and, and hiking, and pretty soon we came to a fork in the road, or fork in the trail, and it wasn't marked which, which way you go. So we sort of, well, let's go this way. And we went that way, and then as we kept going, the trail got smaller and smaller and smaller, and pretty soon we're clearing brush in front of us, and we're thinking, maybe we took the wrong path here. But it was too late to go back. We had gone too far in. The sun was setting, and so we're thinking, we're in a little bit of trouble here. And so what are we, what are we gonna do? So we prayed. And then we said, we got to get our bearings. So we climbed up uh, one of the tallest hills that we could see the close by, climbed up to the top, and when we got up there, we saw there was the highway right down there. <laughs> and so we just headed to the highway, and then we were able to find our way back to the car. But we had to take our bearings. We had to get our bearings so that, oh, okay, now we know where we are. Now we know what we're doing. And that's what this is about today. And I th feel like we need to take a step back, take a deep breath as Christians, and look at the big picture of life and faith and God in order to get our bearings. What we need is a true God-centered eternal perspective to help us recalibrate our view of life in the here and now. We need to understand just how great our God is. And that's what I want to focus on, the big picture, the 30,000-foot view of who God is and what the Lord is about to do in the very near future. My aim, and the Lord's aim, I think, through His Word this morning, is to enlarge your understanding of Him. I want you to leave here this morning thinking, <laughs> we serve a great God. He's got it all under control. We don't need to be fretting and worrying needlessly, but to trust Him and to hope in Him, to encourage you that God is absolutely sovereign over all things, and therefore we need not be fearful or alarmed about either the present or the future. He's got it. Now, we're going to be looking at the ch chapter 40 of the book of Isaiah um, so if you've got a Bible, I encourage you to take it out. We're going to go through the entire chapter this morning. But first, I want to set up for you the context of this passage. Isaiah is, is an amazing book. Isaiah is the most quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. No other book in the Old Testament is quoted more than the book of Isaiah so that tells you how important the book of Isaiah is with regard to the New Testament authors. The book of Isaiah also gives us the most thorough and clear prophecies regarding the coming Messiah, Jesus. And especially appropriate as we're moving into the Easter season, thinking about the advent of Christ. Now, the context of Isaiah's overall message in this book is that Isaiah was a prophet to the kingdom of Judah, which was a southern kingdom, and he prophesied during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. So he had a long tenure as the chief prophet of Judah. And like most of the prophets, his message was one that included both dire warnings and glorious promises. 
The pattern of God's people has never changed. From the beginning of Christianity till today, the pattern of God's people is always one of embracing faith and then falling away, and then needing revival and embracing faith and then slowly falling away. It's the history of Israel. It's the history of Christianity. And so that's why we come to church. That's why we fellowship together. That's why we encourage one another in our faith, because without that, we will fall away. We will drift. We will lose our bearings, as it were. So the context then of this chapter, chapter 40, it begins a new section of the book. Chapters 1 through 39 are aimed at Isaiah's contemporary people, the leaders, the kings, and the contemporary um, people around him. Starting in chapter 40, it is aimed at the future, generations. So it's anticipating the eventual exile into Babylon. So he's predicting, he's prophesying that the nation of Israel will be taken captive and brought into Babylon 150 years in the future. But it's also speaking to us today as exiles in our own land, exiles in our own culture. He predicts in chapter 39, verses 5 through 7, he's predicting the captivity of the nation in Babylon. He says, Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord, and some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the place or in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Isaiah is prophesying 150 years before it happens what's going to happen. And it happens just the way he describes it. But then he moves into chapter 40, and Isaiah gives us all hope that our great and glorious God and Father will not leave us or forsake us, And never will we have to be alone. So now let's examine this magnificent passage. There are three prominent themes that stand out as you read through chapter 40. And I want to highlight them before we start so that you can see them as we go through the text. Theme number one, God as the God of all comfort and hope. Theme number two, His word stands forever. And number three, that God's glory and power and greatness is sovereign over all things. So let's dive in. Chapter 40, and now we'll start with verse 1, and I'm just going to kind of comment on this text as we go through it. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. So God's word to his people through the prophet Isaiah here is one of comfort and reassurance. So he's just prophesied to them that they're going to be taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. And his very next words to them are, comfort, comfort my people, and to speak tenderly to them and to promise them that they will be cared for. It's interesting to compare that word of comfort, comfort my people, says your God. It's a common theme throughout Scripture of God granting his people comfort and care. Remember from the New Testament and Matthew chapter 5 and the Beatitudes, you know what the Beatitudes are, but blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Absolutely. In fact, all of the Beatitudes are regarding comfort and assurance. That's the whole point of them. Moving on to verse 3. 
A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Sound familiar? It should. This familiar phrase is used in all four of the Gospels to describe the mission of John the Baptist. God is up to something here. He's on the move. That's a clue as to the true focus of this passage, that being asked to consider what is God up to? What is He doing? Verse 4, Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill will be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So here too, there is a major seismic shift coming. Isaiah is prophesying that this major seismic shift is something that the people of God should be looking for, anticipating, hoping for, knowing that it is coming. And verse 5 I think, is the key verse to the entire chapter. But we're not going to deal with that today. That will be next week. Moving on to verse 6. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all of its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. That's an amazing statement and an incredibly important statement for us to grasp, to believe, to understand. That there's only one thing in this world that is permanent, and that's God's word. And that includes the promises. This book that we read and study and pray over is an amazing gift from God to us. This is God's Word. He gave it to us to encourage us, to help us, to strengthen us. And so may God grant you help and strength and comfort as you read and study this Word and it will stand forever. When all else is gone, when everything else has disappeared, this will remain. This is our sure hope that God has given us. Now, the next section of this chapter is the longest and most complete of the chapter, and its focus is on two things. Its focus is on The greatness of God, which we sang about this morning, is to focus on His glory, on His might, and on His tender love. And the other focus is on His absolute sovereignty over all things. His sovereignty over nature, His sovereignty over history, His sovereignty over rulers. That's especially comforting to me in these days, to recognize that the rulers in the world who are doing bad things, they will be held accountable by God, and they will one day be vanquished. Verse 9, go up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news, lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. It's an amazing passage. It's the juxtaposition of God's greatness and power 
with his tenderness as a shepherd who loves his sheep and will carry you in his arms. It's a beautiful picture. Now, verses 12 through 26 form a remarkable, powerful, humbling rebuttal to us or to anyone who thinks God is not very big or cannot control the outcome of history or is up in heaven right now wringing his hands wondering what to do. That's not God. God's got it under control. All of this is unfolding just as God designed it. And so here's his response to those who question his sovereignty and his power and might. Verse 12, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, which is it's a measurement from the tip of your thumb to the tip of your little finger is a span. And closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? These, of course, are rhetorical questions, but each one of them has a clear answer, and that is no one but God himself. Continuing in verse 15, behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust of the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. So you see, God is not worried about what is going on in the world. He's not fretting over the evil that seems to be so prevalent. He's not fretting over Russia. He's not fretting over Ukraine. He's not fretting over China. He's not fretting over the U.S. He can and will bring any nation to dust as he pleases. Just consider it. Some of the most powerful leaders and nations in history. Where are the pharaohs now? Where are the Caesars now? Where is Alexander the Great now? Where's Genghis Khan now? Where's Napoleon? Where's Hitler? Where's Stalin? They all died, and their kingdoms and their nations crumbled. Verse 18, to whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. These three verses illustrate the utter folly of trusting in anything other than our one true God. Verse 21. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them. And they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. Our God, who made the heavens and earth, who inhabits the heavens and earth, can simply blow on the most powerful, wicked leaders and institutions on earth, and they float away like stubble. 
So we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to worry about. Verse 25. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. He's talking about the stars here. Think about this. Astronomers estimate that there are between 100 and 400 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. I mean, that's a number that's too big for me to get my mind around. But there's an estimate between 100 and 400 billion stars in just our galaxy. Astronomers also estimate that there are over 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Now, we maybe have some math teachers here who can understand how many zeros that represents, but it's a lot of zeros. That would mean, if you do the math, that would mean that there are likely over 200 billion trillion stars in the universe. 200 billion trillion stars in the universe. God knows them all by name. He made them. They're his. And you might think, how is that even possible? How can you come up with 200 billion trillion names? Well, he's God. <laughs> he's not limited by his memory the way we are. He also knows the number of hairs on the heads of 7 billion people on earth. I'm not going to do the math for you there, but the estimate is there's 100,000 hairs on the average person's head. So you get the idea. It's a lot of hair. God knows them all. I don't know if they have names. I don't think they have names, but, but they're numbered. <laughs> he also knows every thought of every mind. And I'm getting that from 1 Kings 8, verse 39. So, you see, it's more than possible that God would know the names of 200 billion trillion stars in the universe because he is a great and mighty and omniscient God. He knows everything. Verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Jacob and Israel are the names of the, the kingdoms, the northern and southern kingdoms, and they're complaining that they don't think the Lord sees their plight. The fact that they're, the northern kingdom is already nearly taken over by the Assyrians, and Jacob, uh, or uh, Judah, has already been prophesied that it will be taken into captivity in 150 years. Verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. We, you know, we read these words and it's so difficult for us as finite human beings to come to terms with what does it mean to be an everlasting God? I mean, I, I'm 68 years old and that seems like a long time and, and it's just, it's nothing. It's nothing compared to a God who has no beginning and no end. He is everlasting And then to consider that his mind, his understanding is unsearchable. You know, we, we live in an age where searching has become a lot easier. <laughs> you know, when I was a young man and, you know, student in college, to search meant you had to go to the library and, you know, walk through the stacks and try to 
it, you know, you'd look like this because the spines are all like this, and so I'm walking up and down the stacks, and it would take a long, long time just to find one thing. You don't know how good you've got it. Uh, you know, in the, since the Google era started, searching has become a lot easier. But even with that, we cannot search God's mind. We can only know it through this. This is where we know God's mind. But even there, it's what we know is such a tiny bit of what there is to know. 29. And here's the comfort that comes back. He starts with comfort at the beginning of the chapter, and now he brings comfort back at the end of the chapter. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths who are young and strong and fast and vigorous, even youths shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. That's a favorite verse for many people. It's a familiar verse and a, fit, and a very worthy verse to know and to memorize as an encouragement in your life. But now you have a context for it. Now you see the context of it. It's the context of it in, verse, in chapter 40 here is that we serve a great God who is a God of comfort and a God of strength who's inexhaustible, who's everlasting, whose mind is unsearchable, He's the one who's making this promise that he will bear you up on eagle's wings. No matter what you're facing, no matter what disappointment you have, no matter how challenging your life is, our God is able to do this. He has created everything. He knows everything. He does not grow weary, and he's able to help us when our strength fails. So, let's... Linger just for a moment on that, verse 31. But they who wait for the Lord. That's a key question. Who are those? Who is the they in that verse? Who is the they who wait on the Lord? Well, let's say they are serious Christians. When you're living in exile, you don't have the ability to do much to help yourself feel better or to change your surroundings or your circumstances to make life better. And so you, you literally, when you're in exile, you're forced, as if it's a bad thing, you're forced to rely on God, to wait on Him, to plead with Him, Lord, deliver us. Deliver us from this present evil age. And that's what the they is here. It's their serious Christians who put their hope and their faith, and their trust in God, the only one who can deliver them. They're not frightened, and they're not discouraged by the hard things in life. They're not easily offended by the indignities that exiles often have to endure because they know what's coming, that God has promised deliverance, that God is sovereign over all of history, that God will redeem this world. They know that the Lord is with them and for them, like a tender shepherd. He will carry them in his bosom, as it said in the first verses of this chapter. And then when you're running the race and you're getting weary, God says, I will bear you up on eagles' wings. The they who wait on the Lord, they know that all evil and all pain and all tears will one day be wiped away, and your joy will be full. I don't know if you are Lord of the Rings fans or anybody who's a Lord of the Ring fan here, but in the third and final installment of the Lord of the Rings uh, movie series, The Return of the King, there's this glorious scene at the end where Frodo and Sam have 
gotten rid of the ring, it's been and tossed in and it's been destroyed and they rush out of the mountain as the volcano erupts and they're laying on the rock and they're exhausted near death and they assume they're about to die. And then they hear the, the sound of the eagles that come and fly and swoop down and pick them up and carry them away from danger. And this is a beautiful picture, really. I mean, that filmmaker is not a Christian, but God gave him special grace to create a film that would be inspiring. And, and that's the picture that this verse represents, is that we'll be carried away, no strength of our own, but carried away on eagle's wings. So how do we apply a great chapter like this to our life? How do we take this, what we've just read, about the greatness, the bigness, the glory of God and his tender, loving care? Friends, we have a great God. Don't think too little of him. Don't take him for granted. Trust him. Put your full faith and hope in him. Recognize him. No matter what your circumstances are right now, God is large and in charge. And you can trust him. You can hope in him and should hope in him. Meditate on his greatness, his glory and his might. Read about his greatness and his glory and his might. Rejoice in the amazing reality that this great and awesome, powerful God loves us and cares for us. It's just a mind-boggling reality. Therefore, if you're here this morning and you're hurting or feeling anxious or frustrated or fearful or feeling increasingly like an exile and a stranger in your own culture, don't let the things around you discourage you. Don't let them bring you down. Don't let them make you feel hopeless. Trust in God. Put your hope in Him. Fight the fight of faith that remembering God is your refuge and strength. Take the 30,000-foot view of life and faith, remembering He's in control and you're in His hands. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you that you are such an amazing God. Thank you that you are the author of life. You are the creator, the everlasting God who can make nations dust with a blow. And I pray, Father, that you, you would redeem this world, that you would encourage your children, that you would strengthen your saints, that you would help us, Lord, to walk filled with hope, filled with courage, filled with trust in you, no matter what our circumstances are, whether we're, our bodies are falling apart, whether our families are struggling, whether our employment situation is a mess, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that we would focus not on those things as the main truth in reality in the universe, but that we would focus on you, that you are the main truth and reality in the universe and that you are sovereign over all. So Lord, we thank you. Bless us, encourage us, strengthen us this day. In Jesus' name, amen.